Can SA do 3% GDP growth next year? Certainly, there's a compelling case they can. Delistings galore, Bell and Sassfin. Pick and pay is X rights issue, and we've got FOMC and MPC over the next couple of weeks. This is JC Direct, episode 595 for 18 July. My name is Simon Brown. This podcast is brought to you by JustOneLap.com. There wasn't a show last week, and for that, I must apologize. It was completely my uh, my fault. We started a new podcast, which JC Direct is not going away. Don't worry about that. Uh, But we have started a new one. Uh, Nicolette Michele, uh, Jimmy Moyoha, and myself called Insider Exchange. And what we did is we were promoting that last week in lieu of JC Direct. I forgot that that meant there was nothing in your feed. Uh, Apologies. Anyway, back to normal. Uh, That won't happen. Well, I was going to say it won't happen again. But you know what? It might well happen again. Anything is possible. Uh, Certainly mistakes are very possible. But let's get to that SA GDP. So IMF came out on Tuesday and said, uh, well, GDP, 3.2% for this year. South Africa, 0.9%. So let's use that 0.9% as our base case. And what can we load onto it for next year? Well, let's say markedly reduced load shedding, i.e. a little bit of stage one or two, but broadly load shedding out the window, not happening, certainly no level four, stage four, stage six, stage whatever the case may be. Uh, That, Saab will tell you, South African Reserve Bank, that can add a percent to GDP. So we're at one and a half. We've got the two-part system kicking in on the 1st of September. We're seeing a lot of data I've seen from Investec, I've seen from Nedbank. They all say uh, they expect about 40 billion rand to be withdrawn by South African investors, uh, and they're going to spend that 40 billion. Some of it on debt, much of it on holidays and dinners and, and home extensions and those sort of things. What is that? But 0.4 to a GDP, according to the experts. So now we're at a 2.3% GDP. We're expecting rate cuts, more on that in a bit. But certainly rates this time next year, perhaps even by the end of this year, we should be half a percent down. By the middle of next year, uh, most folks are saying 1% down. Investec is saying rate cuts for 1.5% by the middle of next year. That is now just money flowing into our economy, absolutely flowing into our economy. We add that to our equation. We've got inflation at 4.5% by mid-year. We had a 3% GDP for 2025. Now, a lot can go wrong. I mean, wars, uh, gl- uh, recessions in the U.S., uh, our local GNU can go uh, or belly up. A-, a lot can happen. But there is a world in which we have a 3% GDP next year. And we've got to ask ourselves, what is the likelihood of it? So is it 100%? No, it's not. So let's go back to that base case. 0.9 is what we expected to do this year. Can we add the 1% from uh, uh, reduced load shedding? I think we, we can add that, and I think we can give that, I would say probably a easy 60 or 70% chance that load shedding gets a little worse. I was going to say stays where we are, but we haven't had load shedding in excess of 100 days now. So it gets a little bit worse, stage one and two, but not markably worse at all. Uh, Do we get the money spending from the two-part system? 100% chance. That money is coming. It is going to be spent. Maybe the numbers aren't as big. Maybe the Investec and Nedbank boffins haven't quite got it right, but I think there's certainly a 100% chance of that happening. Rate cuts. Okay, so... Rate cuts uh, half a percent by middle of next year, high probability. Uh, One or one and a half percent, lower probability. So let's target one percent rate cuts by the middle of next year, which frees up consumer spending. And I think we can probably put that at around a 50 or 60 percent probability. Inflation at 4.5 percent by the middle of next year. I think we can put that at a 50, 60, 70 percent probability. All of this adds up to 3% GDP in 2025, and I reckon the odds are probably 60 to 70%. 
Now, I've said already, there's a lot that can go wrong. I mean, recessions in the U.S. or just in South Africa. Uh, the, I was going to say, you know, global commodity prices collapse. It depends. Gold is doing great. Uh, PGMs are doing absolutely horror. Depends which side of that equation that you sit. Oil goes to 120 with conflict or who knows why uh, and pushes inflation up. I mean, there's a lot that can go wrong to it, but I think – Next quarter, two-thirds possibility that we have a 3% GDP number in South Africa for 2025. I should have checked what that is, but it's certainly going to be the highest in a long time, like a decade perhaps or more perhaps. Maybe we've got to go back to latter part of the Mbeki era, early days of Zuma when we still had the World Cup excitement 2010. It's been a decade or more. And what that means, and I've spoken about it here often, if you are a South African Inc. business, uh, whether you're a bank or a retailer, you've been unable to grow the business by organic market share. You've had to grow your business by stealing customers from your competitors. Think of ShopRite eating everybody's lunch out there. Uh, they haven't been doing it in a booming economy. They've just been stealing market share from mom and pop grocers, from pick and pay, from spa, uh, from everybody else. Uh, Woolies, Woolies to lesser degree. But you get the point. Uh, same with the banks. Same with the insurers. You know, they're selling more insurance policies. Well, to who, right? They're not selling it because there's up-and-coming wealth in our economy. They're selling it because they stole it from the competitor down the road. Suddenly, they're still stealing from competitors or trying to, but suddenly there's actual economic growth. Suddenly we're getting per capita income growth, which at 0.9%, our population growth is probably around one4 We've all been getting poorer for the last decade. So notwithstanding the GNU rally, and someone on Twitter today was saying, is the GNU rally over? Well, no, it's just it's not going to happen in a straight line. Yeah, we had a, a bleak Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday was looking rough as I record this. But, I mean, it, this rally is not a, a straight line all the way from the bottom left to the top right. It's going to have setbacks. I mean, so far, no politician has put their foot in it. And you've got to say, that's a biggie. I mean, what, we're two weeks in and we don't have a politician put in their foot in. But the GNU rally is not over yet. It might not survive. It might die pr prematurely. Those are absolutely possible. But add that together with a 3% GDP. That SA Inc. story, which is compelling already, and I've spoken a lot about it, suddenly becomes more compelling by, I think, potentially a long way. We've got two events uh, coming up. One is today, if you're listening today, 18 July. It's uh, Power Hour 5.30, either at Standard Bank here in Rosebank, Johannesburg, or in Webcast. Uh, defensive income portfolio, local and offshore. Important words there are defensive income, and then, of course, local and offshore. And then 22 August, we've got Mishima Gama, who I rate as one of the best TA principals in the country, uh, and she's going to be doing Let's Learn Some Charting. Because remember we did the... Uh, unlocking the potential of uh, trading as a side hustle. That was our June power hour, uh, hugely successful. But I touched briefly on technical analysis. I didn't go deep into it. Two reasons, time constraints, and secondly, I am not the TA guru. You've seen some of my charts. There's not a lot happening there in that regard. However, uh, we're getting Mishima Gama on, and she is a technical analyst guru, and she will help us understand technical analysis, how to make it work, etc. So those are those two. We've got a third that will be coming in August. I can't say anything about it just yet. It's a product launch. But those you'll find more, justonelab.com slash events for booking and more information. So as I record this Wednesday afternoon, the MPC, Monetary Policy Committee, is meeting to deliberate interest rate cuts or hikes or no changes, I suppose. Hikes are off the table. Announcement will be Thursday afternoon. Expected is no change whatsoever. I said up front, Investec is looking at uh, cuts of 1.5% by mid next year, by July of next year. Standard Bank's looking for 1%. Some of the other banks are more cautious and saying half a percent. The question is when? Is it September? Uh, is it November? When do we start? I think September and November, but I think our bank's going to move cautiously, quarter percent of each. We've also got the FOMC, Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell and his team at the end of July, uh, their meeting on interest rates. 
my sense is not. Although, interestingly, uh, FT was reporting this morning, Wednesday morning, on an interview in uh, Business Week. It was recorded in June, an interview they had with Trump, where he basically said that if Jerome Powell wants to keep his job, he mustn't cut rates before the election. Now, I've been saying I don't think he would. I thought November would be the first and then a December cut. Uh, the MPC, our local meetings are very uh, cyclical every two months in the u.s it's all over the place but so they've got a july a september a november and then a december i don't think they were going to cut before the election truthfully i hope that they now do because a a, a a presidential candidate threatening the central bank i mean this is this is what happens in turkey let's be clear this is what happens in turkey and if you want to know how that worked out go have, have a look at turkey and uh, the crisis that is that economy nonetheless i don't think we're getting any july cuts i think south africa will get september cuts i think the u.s will probably get november cuts and that's all great news we like interest rate cuts we would have liked them a year ago, two years ago, whenever, but certainly we would like them. I chatted Money Web Now show uh, this morning, Wednesday morning, and we were talking around it, and I was saying to her, you know, does he cut? And she says, you know what, by one measure, we're back on the target. We have 5.1. But remember our governor's wanting to lower that. Also, remember, he also talks 4.5%, but also he wants to get it to 3%. So maybe there's a little bit of a lag so that inflation almost overshoots to the downside, and then we can quickly say, well, uh, why don't we, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that the governor or his MPC are a, a bunch of, uh, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for here? I, I don't think they're chances like that. I don't think they're crooks or anything like that. But, I mean, Lexi, I, 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 you know, I, my sense is, as I say, I think September and November for South Africa. Uh, and those are the consensus is that those will both be quarter percent cuts, not anything more than that. We've had a bunch of delistings announced in the market. Uh, we've got Sasfin doing a partial delisting. We've got Bell doing a complete delisting, both announced on Monday. Both small caps, both illiquid. Bell at about 53 rand. There was a 10 rand attempt a couple of years ago, uh, which got completely rebuffed. If you've been holding either, you're sitting pretty. But both are chunky premiums to the prices just before the announcement, sort of 30% odd premiums. I do expect more. And I'm, you know... I thought as an exercise, which ones would be most likely? And you can run your eye down that list and almost all of them jump out at you in the very small cap space. So like the, the education stocks, they're, they're a bigger story, right? But in your small caps, your, uh, what is it? Your ISAs, for example, your CMHs, your, although CMH has been around absolutely forever, why would they suddenly delist? Your Calgary M3s, I think there's huge possibility of more coming can we construct a portfolio to try and target it yes but i think you're better off just trying to construct a portfolio which is well positioned for these companies that are going to have a good couple of years thank you three percent gdp and thank you gnu government so I, I don't think we need to target necessarily takeouts we will make that money anyway uh the takeout perhaps just brings some of it forward more than anything else We've also got the pick and pay rights issue. Uh, the stock went X rights on uh, Tuesday at the close. So they are now trading uh, and the, the no paid letters are now on market and also trading. And so th the terms are quite simple. You would have woken up Wednesday morning for every 100 pick and pay shares that you held. You've now got 51.11 no paid letters. You can sell those no paid letters in the market if you want. They have a value which is current pick and pay price, less the take-up price of 15 rand 96. If you don't want to sell them in the market and you want to take up your rights, you then need to have 15 rand 96 per no paid letter. And the code in the no paid letter is P-I-K-N. You need 15 96 per no paid letter and you instruct your broker to take up the rights and you buy new pick and pay shares at 15 rand 96. If you don't want to take up the rights, you must sell the shares. And if you if you want to take up the rights, you must have the money and instruct your broker. And both of these need to happen before the 30th of July. If they don't happen by the 30th of July, the letters expire worthless and you lose money. It is that simple. And I know what the problem is. Some of you have got a handful of these. They're trading at about eight rand a share and you're only going to net 400 bucks or 200 bucks and your brokerage is going to be a whole truckload fine but sell them anyway because you'll make a couple hundred bucks otherwise you're just going to lose the money
The question is, am I taking up the rights? No, I don't have pick and pay shares, so I don't get the rights. Uh, I'm interested in pick and pay, but I'm waiting for all of this dust to settle, and then I'll have a good hard look. I think Sean Summers, he has a good chance of being able to, to, to get this working. Certainly, I think he does. Is it going to be easy? No, but there are going to be some very easy wins. Uh, there are going to be some hard wins as well. But shutting down some of the stores and stuff, that's some easy stuff to do, uh, fixing up distribution centers and the like. The hard part is getting the SA consumer back into pick and pay. That is absolutely going to be the hard part. And we need to see uh, how he manages to go with that. But remember, if you were holding pick and pay at close on Tuesday, you've now got nil paid. You've got to do something with them by the 30th of July. And don't wait for 4 o'clock on the 30th. Do it earlier. Get in early. Uh, we've also got... Uh, an interesting, uh, I think it's interesting, and I suppose that's a, a, a moot because I wrote it. Um, property stocks in South Africa have suddenly been on the move. Uh, I did a, a, a write-up on them earlier on the year, and at that point they were looking fairly ugly. Uh, and But I, I, then I said as well, I said, you know what, there's, there's something here. The yields are attractive. Uh, they, they're certainly looking better positioned. Anyway, I went and redid it, and they're looking a lot better. So the one-year chart, I mean, we've got this year's prop up 32%, it's, and these are at uh, close of Tuesday. Uh, the Satrix property, 31 the the one invest property, 29%. Um, yields between 58 and 7.3%. So all in all, I think they're looking quite lacquer. I think they well positioned i think we're certainly seeing some interest here in happening in the in the property space and these are not bad one year returns now you're going to say well i i've missed it haven't i, I mean the act, the actual low was back in october and i can tweak uh, that chart to a degree there we go let's make it stop there um which gives us slightly better returns of around 36 to down to 34% returns since those lows in October. That excludes distributions, of course. But I think this is still early days. These stocks are not yet expensive. I think there's still opportunity in that space. If you want to see the article, justonelap.com slash ETFs. It's all there, and you can go and uh, get all the details around those three different ETFs. Remember, tonight... 18 July, I will be at the Rosebank, uh, Standard Bank head office up here in Johannesburg. We're going to be looking at income, defensive income stocks. And i got to say, there are some chunky yields, not just uh, on the JSC, but I mean, there are, there are uh, income ETFs in the, in the US in dollars earning 5% yield per year. Some good numbers. Just one lap.com slash events if you want more around that. But we'll park that there for this week. Uh, apologies for missing last week. I, I knew what I was doing, but I didn't. And that unfortunately is how it rolls. Uh, I'll try not to do that again. My name is Simon Brown. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by just one lap.com. If you're loving the show, please leave us a positive rating and a great review in your podcatcher of choice. It helps the podcast. It's been going for some 14 odd years. Until next week, look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.